if this worked, wouldn't everybody be doing it, right? But then you're catching people in like their most vulnerable state, right? They are yes. probably desperate if they have something yes. like an injury and they've been looking around for treatments and cures and they want to believe. Today, we're going to discuss two big medical fraud cases in Washington state. The first is a case involving a stem cell scam in which a local doctor in Seattle, Dr. Tammy, was guilty of selling unproven stem cell treatments as a cure-all for many diseases, including COVID. The second case is a follow-up to episode 18, A Cosmetic Surgeon Gets in Trouble, where Dr. Sajin was found guilty of illegally requiring patients to sign NDAs, posting fake positive reviews, and before and after photos, and suing patients who wrote bad reviews. Regulatory attorney Becky Shao is here to help sort out what these two fraudsters were up to. This is Med Spa Mayhem, the podcast all about the chaotic world of medical aesthetics. From Botox to lasers to IV bars, learn how to tell real versus fake, legal versus illegal, and safe versus potentially deadly. Hear the crazy stories inside the med spa world and find out what questions to ask and how to spot the people cutting corners. I'm your host, Dr. Kate D. Together we explore the wild west of medicine that is the aesthetics industry. This is Dr. Kate D, and I am here today with my good friend, Becky Shao. She is my regulatory attorney friend, who I often ask onto the podcast to comment about legal cases. So thanks for being back here today, Becky. Hi, Kate. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. It's a Sunday morning here. I'm recovering from COVID. And, and how are you doing? It's good. It's sunny here in the Pacific Northwest. I'm actually here in the Pacific I know. Welcome Northwest, so. to the Great Northwest. Hopefully Thank we'll you. win you over. <laughs> Becky's here for a few months visiting our fine area. So I, I asked yeah. you today because resurfacing in the news recently was this a case about a Dr. Tammy who actually appears in my book. So this case was similar but different to the case that we talked about earlier about a different doctor who is an ENT who recently, in, in his case, also resurfaced over the last two weeks as well. So I was hoping we can update people on that at the end here. But here's the deal with Dr. Tammy. So she was sued, a civil lawsuit by our Attorney General, Bob Ferguson, because of her illegal stem cell clinic. Now, what he ultimately found was that he fined her $500,000 for marketing and advertising stem cell treatments for a variety of things, promising that it was this cure-all, but including COVID-19. So she had been treating people with various disorders before that. And then when COVID hit, she started selling it as a COVID cure. So it looks like 107 people paid up to $10,000 for various treatments. There's never been any medical research that ever said that these treatments could treat those things. And she was advertising it in this kind of out there way as a, as a cure. So can you comment on the major legal points of this case? Yeah, I mean, what's interesting, first of all, and this is like a technicality, but I, I looked at the consent decree. It's actually $800,000, and it would be basically suspended once the $300,000 of that would be suspended when she complied with the consent decree. So I thought that was interesting. I have no idea why they structured it that way. But the claims or the allegations, as you said, which are actually laid out in the consent decree in the sense that she agreed to stop doing a number of things, including advertising, marketing, receiving compensation for this, the stem cell treatments and making claims about them that they could help with Parkinson's, neuropathy, COVID, all, all sorts of things, right? And I guess what's interesting is some of these are what I would consider FGA marketing claims, basically 
the gist of it is that you can't make certain claims about certain products without having the data to back it up. And so correct, he took a, I guess, an FDA regulatory role in this sense, right? And even though it's categorized under the broader false advertising, improper marketing type, yeah. type of law in in Washington State. So, so let's let's back up just a moment, and I want to explain what stem cells are. And what they can be used for, there's a ton of research going on for stem cells, but basically a stem cell means that it is a cell that can develop into a different kind of cell. So when you're a fetus and you start from a fertilized ovum, that is the ultimate pluripotent cell, meaning that cell can grow into any organ, any kind of tissue. And then as the fetus develops, it becomes more and more that certain cells become a one type of cell, like a liver cell or a brain cell. Okay. In an adult, you are filled with, you're made up of cells that do one thing and they can't become a different cell. So a skin cell can't change and become a brain cell. Okay. So where are stem cells in your body? Where are there still some stem cells that you can create new tissue with? And there are some, right? And so in the in the skin, there are cells that can become different kinds of skin cells, but it can't go back and become a liver cell. Okay, and interesting. Yeah. I didn't actually know sure. that. About and stem and so cells. adults don't have a lot of stem cells, but mm-hmm. the ones we've used traditionally have been in the bone marrow. So your bone marrow has bone marrow stem cells that can become all kinds of different bone marrow cells, and if if you've heard of a bone marrow transplant, what happens is yep. you you can harvest, you can take out a bunch of bone marrow, isolate the stem cells. Now you've got stem cells that become, can become all the bone marrow cells, like your white blood cells and your red blood cells and stuff. And the way bone marrow transplants are done is the person gets those cells taken out, then you irradiate the person, you give them a ton of radiation, kill all their bone marrow. Now, how can you kill bone marrow and not kill the rest of you? Bone marrow is particularly sensitive to radiation. So you can irradiate the whole person. And actually you do. You irradiate all their body and their whole body gets a big radiation dose. And that can cause some damage, but it doesn't kill you. Okay. But it. But why? 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 Because I, you have to get have to rid radiate? of all of your actual bone marrow because that's where the cancer is. So let's say you have... Leukemia. Oh, you're talking about yeah. if you had cancer. Yes. Okay. Not just if you were to take out the bone marrow. Right now. Or, so this know, is usually done as a cancer treatment. So okay. it yeah. started out with treatments for bone marrow cancer. So what you do is you kill the cancer along with the rest of your bone marrow. But then hopefully mm. you take nice, clean stem cells and put them back in. Or this is why people get a donor, right, who matches them. You use their mm. bone marrow that has no cancer in it, and you put it back in them. And now they've got brand new bone marrow from somebody else and and their cancer has been treated. And if you do it successfully, then the person survives it. So that's one treatment that's been used for a long time. And people have used bone marrow transplants to treat various other cancers with various degrees of success, not a ton And so what other things can stem cells be used for? There's a ton of experimentation going on. Uh, Could you take stem cells and put them in your brain and help people with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's? Or could you take stem cells and put them in your heart and, and try to fix damaged heart tissue after a heart attack, right? But where are those stem cells coming from? There are some places that are experimenting with stem cells from fetal tissue, and that, of course, has been controversial there are stem cells from your bone marrow. There are some stem cells in fat or other organs where those stem cells have a limited ability to become other cells. And I actually don't know. I tried to figure out where Dr. Tammy was getting her stem cells. There was one article that I read that said she claimed it was from umbilical cord tissue that was obtained from people after childbirth. And however, the place where she was getting it in this blog post I was reading, they were citing data where when that umbilical cord product was being analyzed, there were no viable stem cells in it. So I don't know where she was getting it. I just know that 
there is absolutely no data to support that any of these treatments actually can be successful. So what was happening was she was not only doing them, but she wasn't saying, hey, this isn't FDA approved. We, we don't know if this is going to work. Total experiment. She was selling it as though it actually cured things. And then she also claimed in the consent decree, is that what we're calling it? I'm so bad with legal jargon. Well, yeah, she cl- claimed in the agreement. settlement that, that people were being enrolled in clinical trials, but actually that wasn't true either. Yeah. What's interesting is I think that you actually don't have to say that what's experimental, that's not actually necessary. You just can't say that it, it's proven to work for X, Y, and Z, or that right. there you can't make claims that are not backed by data or are not accurate or are not truthful. And so I guess if she had just said nothing at all and said, I'm offering stem cells and here's the treatments, that technically is okay, right? She doesn't necessarily have to say, I'm offering stem cells. This is unproven. It's all experimental. So I- I It's an interesting difference. So let me ask you. Right. There's what she was advertising to the public, right? So you cannot claim those things publicly. But what if she says none of that on her website or in her advertisements, but what if she says that all to you in private, in the consultation, making big promises, um, but never documents that. Is that, could she get away with that? No. <laughs> no. So that wouldn't be no. legal either. And if people were willing to no. testify, hey, she told me this was a cure for COVID. That's right. Okay. Got it. That's right. And and that's why I, all, I tell people, because in my career, I have litigated a number of cases ranging from securities fraud out to where I ultimately landed for the bulk of my career and what I still practice now, which is like healthcare and healthcare fraud and healthcare regulatory law. And I always tell people it's actually a fairly easy case compared to, say, a securities fraud or environmental. I've defended some environmental cases where you have to have expert witnesses and you have to have forensic accountants. In a healthcare fraud case, it's usually, what did he tell you? What did she tell you? She said X, Y, and Z. And that can be enough. So if she had not made any of those claims. Now, from an evidentiary perspective, is it easier to prove that someone said something when it's in black and white? Yes, absolutely. But you have to probably have corroborating witnesses and they have to be credible. Got it. Okay. But either way, that's illegal, right? Yeah. So uh, I want people to know, go out there, and the one thing you should know is really any of these stem cell clinics, and they're all over the country, it's a giant scam, okay? So there's no proof that any of those things can do anything. Regenerative medicine has surged over the last few years and has become very, very popular. People, More and more people across the country are offering various unproven treatments for things, and I don't have a problem actually with people experimenting with these things, even if it's outside a trial, as long as they're being honest about it. But the idea that you can get viable stem cells from your fat or somewhere else that are going to do anything for you and that's going to fix your spinal cord injury or your liver disease, it's just not possible, at least certainly not right now at all. And you should not pay your own money for that. If you're going to participate in a clinical trial, it should be done by real scientists who are doing a a really important, not everything's a randomized clinical trial, but people who are really, really looking at proving that any of these things work. And I'll I'll say, by by contrast, Josh, my boyfriend, when he tore his meniscus, we went to see an orthopedist and she, in her practice, she offered PRP and stem cell to fix Yeah. Meniscus. And by contrast, she was very clear. This is not guaranteed. It may not work. We were given, here are your options. None of them, but it could potentially help with the pain. It could potentially help with, but it was all very much caveated. Yeah. And, and, and interestingly, PRP has actually been studied quite a bit by now. So platelet rich plasma first came out, I think in the seventies and people have been using it for orthopedic treatments uh, for decades now. And there have been studies looking at that Mm -hmm. compared to other things. 
The stem, the stem cell part, I really am curious about as to where they got that. Did they get it from a, just a blood draw? I don't know because he <laughs> didn't ultimately. Yeah. He did not ultimately. Oh, he get didn't the do stem it. Cell. Yeah. It, we, he got two PRP sessions, and that came straight out of his own blood. Yes. They spun it and used the plasma from his own yeah, blood. So. Yeah, and and that and none of those things is crazy. And and if you're you know oh my gosh I want to try absolutely everything before I have surgery because this is a big deal and I don't want surgery I want to put it off. It's fine to try out these hail mary things, and if it works for you, great. But it's a whole other thing to advertise and suck people in who who don't know any better and tell them this is going to fix your spinal paralysis. That was one of the cases I was first, I first found out about her stem cell clinic because I had a patient who told me about a expose piece that was on our lo local news station. This was years ago, probably around 2018. I, in researching for this podcast, I, I could not find that original video from then, but they interviewed her and she seemed very sincere in believing that this stuff worked. And they went to her to the seminars and where they were collecting patients. And it was quite, it was like a timeshare presentation. So you take people who are interested in it and you, you tell them a whole story about how we're going to fix you. <clears throat> and so one of the patients was a, teenager who had been paralyzed in an accident and his family believed that this was going to fix this and in the expose back then they were very hopeful still at the time and I don't know what happened to them but we know that that this treatment does not fix that and there as I as I mentioned there are some cells that can grow like skin cells but there are other cells that really don't. And one of the issues we have with the brain and the spinal cord is that they don't regenerate. <laughs> and it's really, really difficult. So once you've severed your spinal cord, it's really not fixable, sadly. And and you can recreate some connections if the nerve endings line up and reattach. And but for the most part function is is gone and it's not fixable. And we're we're there's research always. But what what happened to Christopher Reeve is what happens to any person who severs their spinal cord. And so to sell something for $10,000 promising a cure is pretty egregious. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 on the one hand, I feel sometimes it's hard to conceive of if this worked, wouldn't everybody be doing it, right? But then you're <laughs> catching people in like their most vulnerable state, yes. right? They are probably desperate yeah. if they have something like an injury and they've been looking around for treatments and cures and they want to believe. So it's really... This, I just think this preying difficult. on that person yeah. in particular is is just so terrible, right? I mean, yeah. the idea yeah. that you're going to make money off of this person who's desperate and has nowhere else to yeah. turn and is still hopeful... So I think that's yeah. a component of this that's just incredibly sad. Yeah. So in full disclosure, I, I did know Dr. Tammy. She's here in Seattle, and I've known her for a long time because she lives in my neighborhood, and our kids went to school together. And I always knew her to be a very nice person. <laughs> and I, I, it's very possible that she wholeheartedly believes. I'm not really sure uh, how that's possible, but... She did have a medical degree. Um, interestingly, she went to uh, a place for medical school called the Saba University School of Medicine in the Caribbean. And I had to look that up because where is that? Saba apparently is a small island in the Caribbean. And it is apparently, according to their website, accredited in the Netherlands, and which I imagine is hard to do. The European standards for becoming a doctor are pretty high. So she has a real MD degree, and she is licensed to practice medicine in Washington State still. This, the results of this consent decree were that she couldn't advertise these things, but she did not have her license taken away. She did part of a residency in family practice at Group Health, which has since become Kaiser, but she dropped out of that. She didn't finish her residency. I believe she dropped out in her third year. She never did 
becomes board certified. So she actually has no board certification that's recognized in any specialty. And how, how do you know that? So the American Board of Medical Specialties, which is the board that, that all the medical specialties are part of. So I am okay. board certified in radiology. And if you look me up on the ABMS website, you will see that. And anyone who's so there's only one board for all. The there's cities? a that's the overarching board. Then the right. the, the American right. Board of Radiology, the American <laughs> Board of OBGYN, Internal Medicine, Family Practice. They are all within that giant overarching group. And and so you can find out anybody's board certification by looking that up. It's very rare that somebody has more than one board certification. But can I ask you, this is something that I think we we talk about. And this is, I think this is one of those areas where even if you're a smart, educated person, but you're not a medicine, it is hard, hard to, to know this. Out. Just yeah. like, it's hard That's to why I'm... like, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't even know this. And I consider myself fairly, fairly knowledgeable about certain aspects of medicine. But to me, there are 10,000 different boards, right? I mean, somebody could just slap on, I'm the board of yes, whatever. Yes, you can. How do you, yeah. how do you figure out if you're looking at the right board? That's the thing. So if you are looking up a doctor, you want to look at the ABMS website. So ABMS, and that's a very easy lookup tool. Um, and it will mm -hmm. tell you what people are board certified in. So for any specialty, for any specialty that's Legitimate. It's the umbrella so organization. So as I've mentioned okay. before, we talked about last time that residency is generally three to seven years. Fellowship mm -hmm. is generally one to three years. So it can be a really long time before you are board certified. Okay. You have to do all that training to become board certified. Mm -hmm. If you skip mm -hmm. residency and don't ever do one, which is it's very few doctors in America are not board certified and skip a residency. But if you skip that, then you have no board certification and no training, right? You, I mean, I hate to say it, but you might as well be a nurse practitioner because that's that's what the mid-levels have. So the mid-levels have two years of education and no residency, whereas doctors have four years of education and usually, any again, anywhere from three to 10 or more years of training. And then you become board certified. So the board certification has a giant meaning, okay? So for me, it was seven years of residency and fellowship. And so the, so Dr. Tammy used to call herself a double board certified doctor and on her website and in her email, she called herself double board certified in aesthetic and anti-aging medicine. And what that refers to are two different courses that she took. So there's one called the American Academy of Aesthetic Medicine or the triple AM which is actually a great course. I, I took that course. It's it's a two courses. One, the first one's three days, and the second one's five days. Fun courses. The other course she took was through the American Academy of Anti Aging Medicine. I think that's what it's called, or the A four M. I never took that one. That one's open to non doctors as well, and similar level one, level two courses counted in days. Okay. And then both of these organizations offer what they will call a board exam. So after you've studied for eight days, you can pay money. I know for the AAAM back many years ago, it was over $3,000. And you can take the exam and become board certified. But that's basically what I would call a fake board certification. You, you can't do eight days of training and call yourself board certified. That's sort of an affront to every board certified doctor who studied for 10 years. And then someone comes this on is like that and calls themselves board certified when in fact she has actually no board certification at all. And I mean, this, there's another doctor who I mentioned in the book, who's an OB fine, which is really hard to do. Okay. So it is a four-year residency and so it's four years of med school, four years of residency. If you don't do a fellowship, then you take your boards. That's that's a big deal, okay? But then she also called herself triple board certified because she did two of these. She did one of these fake ones in quote unquote integrative medicine, which also has no board, and then one of the anti-aging ones. So I, I just think that it's a marketing ploy 
but it doesn't have any significance. It doesn't mean that person's educated. Yeah. The problem is, I think, to the lay person, it does How would you know? subscribe yeah. meaning. Well, that's why it I'm talking about it because it sounds because it sounds official, right? Yeah. Like you can that's what I'm saying is you have a bunch of these official sounding organizations that really who knows what they are. But I see like an influx of people who took a sort of like a leadership certification course from like an Ivy League school and they put it on their resume and kind of hold it to be I went to Harvard for right. some and and they're not <laughs> Well, they're not fully accurate can about you, what they want I don't to know much for. about those, but can you take a, a leadership certificate course through Harvard or any of the other fancy schools and not have to apply and get in? You just take it? Yeah. I'm I'm pretty sure I've never done it, but I, I'm pretty okay, sure. Okay, that'll be my I next mean, project and, <laughs> to see if that's yeah. possible. Yeah, you should you should check it out. But so for example, in my world, there are a lot of compliance. So in usually in corporate legal departments, you have lawyers and then you have compliance individuals. And a lot of compliance individuals are lawyers. You can you can be a lawyer and go into compliance, but you can't you can't not have a degree and be a lawyer. You can't practice law. You, so so a lot of times I have seen compliance individuals take some kind of certification course in law and they they zhuzh it up on their resume or on their LinkedIn profiles. Huh. And it, it's 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 not as egregious because no one's really getting hurt. Because they're not practicing sense, law. But yeah, and okay. you're, you're not allowed to practice <laughs> You're not allowed to practice have... medicine without a license yeah. as well. But as we know, that's happening all over the country in aesthetics. That, yeah. So what I, I'm trying to give people enough information so that they can just easily Google it and know what that means. Right. So now we yeah. know that if you did cosmetic surgery, you're not a plastic. Surgeon. And yeah. if you if but, you didn't do a plastic yeah. surgery residency or fellowship, then you can't call yourself a plastic surgeon. We talked about that with Dr. Sage. Right. And and similarly, I, in my opinion, shouldn't be calling yourself board certified when you're not. So hopefully people are getting the tools to be able to look these people up on their own and figure this yeah. out because it's not easy, okay? It no. it took me a couple hours of sleuthing just to sort out what is she saying now. It, Dr. Tammy reinvented her med spa. She has a med spa in the same location as far as I can tell. She's still doing injectables and hormones and she has a new thing on her website called Ativa Skin Tightening, which I'd never heard of. And I, I've been doing skin tightening for 10 years, so I was really curious, what is that machine? And I had to figure that out. So this machine that she has now, which I'm just going to read you because her, her Facebook post from one day ago shows pretty miraculous pictures of a before and after of a neck. And it says, I'm so thrilled. This is my neck. I'm so thrilled to share the incredible results from my recent treatment with Ativa at BioThrive. And this photo was taken just 10 minutes after the procedure, and I can already see a noticeable improvement in the tightness and texture of my skin. And then it goes on to say it's it's a one and done treatment. And so I had to look it up. So Ativa is an RF heating device, and those have been around for a very, very long time. It heats the skin, which then can turn on the fibroblasts and trigger them to make some collagen. And those devices have been around a long time. I used to use one. It has, first of all, it has an immediate edema. So it heats up the skin and your skin swells up a little bit, which is why you have this immediate quote unquote result because your skin is edematous. That is not results at all. That will go away in a matter of minutes to hours. And so claiming that that has immediate results is, is just ridiculous. And And then... RF heating just in general just doesn't do enough to have real significant tightening, especially not after only one treatment. We used to have before we had better RF microneedling. RF microneedling is the standard of care for skin tightening right now. There, I'm sure there will be new devices coming on as things get better, but RF microneedling is, is RF pretty amazing. I, I'm very happy with my personal results with that. 
But nothing. RF is radio radio frequency, frequency right? yeah. So with radio frequency heating, it's just heating up the skin from the outside in. Okay, and heat using a certain frequency. Um, yeah, and using it's really that. it's just heating, and 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 it's it's a little hard okay. to do because you've got to. It's a technique of moving the device around your skin so it doesn't get too hot. Mm. Too hot, it burns. Not hot enough, it has no effect. And it needs multiple treatments and many, many treatments over time to have any kind of significant results. But it's not that it doesn't work at all, but it doesn't do one and done. And it work doesn't have immediate yeah. in- results. And and it doesn't have results nearly as good as, as RF microneedling. So there are many RF microneedling devices that have really replaced those older RF heating devices. And not a lot of places use those RF heating devices that much anymore because they're much better treatments. Yeah. I was I was going back over her consent decree to see if there was anything in in her settlement with AG that precluded her from doing the before and after comparisons as as far as the stem cell case was mm-hmm. concerned. I think I mixed that up with the other case. There was something I think in the other consent decree that prohibited Dr. Sajan from doing that. He was, I think, publishing altered before and afters. He was faking them. Yeah. Interestingly, in this Facebook post from yesterday, she claims that it's her neck, which it very well could be. So, by the way, if that were me and it was actually a claim that you could make, I'd put not an actual patient, right? That would be a disclaimer that I would would put on there. Well, I think she's not a patient. But she says that it's her own neck. I mean, that's got to be. Oh, she does say it. She says, this is my neck. (laughs) So I'm assuming that that's what that means, is that it's hers. This is her public Facebook page. Oh, I see. This is a public page, not a personal page. Yeah. Okay. I see. So in summary, then, about this Dr. Tammy case. So I think the the big thing that, that the attorney general is going after is consumer fraud, basically, right? He's not really focused on medical anything, right? So her false medical claims, it's really about consumer fraud and what can, what can she claim, what can she advertise and what she, she can't. And basically she was advertising all kinds of things that were not proven and taking money from people. Yeah. I mean, technically it is consumer fraud to hold yourself out as being, for example, double certified. If you're not, that's inaccurate and false and misleading and all kinds of other things. But maybe the attorney general is thinking, I'm going to focus on very purely consumer protection versus something that could. I mean, we've talked about this before. Many different bodies and many different agencies have jurisdiction over different parts of the puzzle. And maybe he's thinking that's really a medical board thing. And we, I'll let the medical board enforce. And I don't he know. also I'm may just... not know. That may not have been his focus yeah. and he may not know. I, yeah. One thing that you've taught me and yeah. I've learned through the course of writing the book and doing this podcast is that if there is not a complaint about a thing to the attorney general or the DA or whoever, they will not know about it, and they're not out there policing. They're not out there looking for violations of these things. So if people don't complain, they will have no idea. And I don't know if they're I don't know if they're totally not policing, but I think that it would be very difficult to do that, right? And if they are, I don't know how. So that is a little bit beyond my knowledge. But I suspect that it is difficult to be out there policing and monitoring, et cetera, and and that they do rely, I would say, by and large, heavily on consumers reporting these types of instances to them. My other takeaway, by the way, is that people don't really want to pretend to be lawyers. They just want to pretend to be doctors. (laughs) What does that say about my profession? No one's really out there being like, I could be your lawyer. That's hilarious. Uh, Maybe the law shows... Are, don't depict lawyers nearly in as good a light as the doctor Probably shows. Probably not. <laughs> There's no McDreamy. Or maybe there are. There are McDreamies on uh. the law shows. I did recently meet a guy who was named after a character on L.A. Law because his parents thought that they really, really liked that character. Oh, my God. That's <laughs> so funny. He's in his 30s. It's really funny. So there are some lovely redeeming lawyer characters out there. Um, anyway, thanks, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about on television. 
<laughs> yeah. So let's update everybody on on Dr. Sajin because that just finalized. So the last time we spoke, there were four major allegations that he was suing over and one of them had been settled and he was found, yeah, he agreed he was guilty of that one part. But now the rest of them, so all the other things. So he, in the first part, was found to have forced people to sign NDAs before even having any kind of treatment. And that those consultation fees that were subsequently charged had to be refunded. But then there were several other charges, all of which have, he's been basic. I don't know, you, you don't call it found guilty, but he's agreed that he did wrong. And he's been now fined $5 million um, total for not only forcing people to sign uh, NDAs before being treated, but also intimidating people threatening to sue people for negative reviews, having his own employees post positive reviews, doctoring before and after photos, and basically putting himself out there, sort of falsely elevating his reputation in order to sell more services to patients. Do you want to, do you want to just comment on any of those legal things? No, wrap up on I, mean, him? I think that is no, that's basically the gist of the consent decree, or another word for it is a settlement agreement with the state AG's office. It was $5 million plus interest. Post-judgment interest, 12% a year. That's oh, quite that's a lot. lot. And if you compare it with Dr. Tammy, I think is really the scale, right? Mm -hmm. I think 6,000 people were impacted. That's a lot of folks. 6,000 people. He's prohibited or, in legal terms, enjoined from doing all the things that you've named, getting pre or post procedure NDAs, threatening people, posting fake reviews on social media, et cetera. And interestingly enough, only 750000 of that $5 million is going to the, I would call them patients or victims, although it's not technically a victim because it's not a criminal case, but as restitution, which is Basically, I'm paying you back mm. is the way to, to think about restitution. And then the rest of it goes to the state AG's office, hopefully, hopefully to handle more cases like this. We, we don't That's know. That's interesting. But. So does that imply that the total financial damages to these people is $750,000 approximately or under that? I think it basically says to compensate these patients for their damages, $750,000 will go to, to them as restitution. But I mean, I don't know. I'm bad at math because I'm a lawyer, but $750,000 divided by 6,000 people, that's not a whole heck of a lot of money yeah. per person. Yeah. And then you've got the four plus million going to the attorney general's office. I'm, I'm just assuming that outcomes were not terrible, right? This is a bad, yeah, I, I mean, it may yes, very well be yes. that you have a lot of those people are, are happy with their result. Whether or not the they had to sign an NDA, they signed it, they paid the money, they were happy with the results. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't actually have any evidence that the guy's a bad surgeon, actually. Yeah. He just yeah. is strong, was strong arming patients and lying on his website, lying about being a plastic surgeon and one of the entities, he, he was operating under many different names, doing business under many different names, one of which was a plastic surgery center. So, so he was, we went over what is a plastic surgeon versus a cosmetic surgeon. And we tried to piece together because he's an ENT, but not a plastic surgeon. And what, what does that mean? What can you say in your website? And I don't know that any of that is particularly policed, right? But he was doing body plastic surgery as a ear, nose, and throat board-certified doctor. And, and one of his entities was called Plastic Surgery Center. So, so he was advertising plastic surgery. And I don't know that that's illegal. I just think that that's personally just misleading if you're a face yeah. doctor and you're operating on tummies. Okay, so I have to correct myself since we're talking okay. about being oh, wow. truthful and misleading. So the consent decree. So it is a $5 million settlement. 
720000 of that is going to go to 6,000 patients who will be reimbursed their consultation fee. So $100 they paid and then interest at $20. $20. So they're going to get $120 each, those 6,000 patients who paid the $100 consultation fee. And then so that totals $720,000. Separately, there's a, a bucket of 15,000 patients who will be paid $50 each for a total of $750,000 who did not pay a consultation fee. I guess it's just for, I don't know, okay. convenience or being misled. So okay. that totals about $1.5 million to about over 20,000 patients that we're talking about. So that's a decent chunk of money. And then the rest will go to the attorney general's office for attorney's fees and monitoring and enforcing the consent decree. So got so it. It's, okay. What? Two, two and a half million. God, I'm so bad at math. <laughs> three okay. and a, three and a half, three and a half million. Sorry. Oh, that's God. funny. Yeah, that's okay. I don't think are, there are any math prerequisites for law school. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <know. laughs> Actually, no, oh, no, they're okay. not. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Interestingly, for medicine, if you're pre-med, not only do you is there a math, biology, physics, chemistry, there's actually an English prerequisite too. So you have to have a year of college English. So we are supposed to be able to write and speak English, which is a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> I think this has been a really interesting discussion. I, I just want everyone to take home that you really need to do your research in figuring out who these people are before signing up. And look up, and this is true for every different kind of service, who is the provider and what's their credential and look it up. And who's the medical director and what is their credential and look that up. Where do we look it up, Kate? On the, on the ABMS website. And then the nursing board has, the, has a similar tool. Or the, I guess if you're a doctor, right, you'd look up medical board. I mean, what's, because sometimes I can go to the Department of Health and look up someone's yeah, license. Yeah, you can look up as, anyone's medical license through, there is a national provider index and doctors, nurses, PAs all get a number that we're assigned and you can yeah. look anybody up. And it's but not that hard. that's different than the board certification. Correct, yeah. So though. you can look up that yeah. they're licensed and yeah. then for doctors, you want to look up their board certification, if only because you want to know that they're not lying. <laughs> I don't, I mean, it's so weird that that lying has become such an integral part of our economy, but it just is apparently. Mm -hmm. And I, maybe because I'm old and I'm like a Gen X person, I have this total aversion to lying. So the moment somebody lies to me, they're dead to me. And, and mm -hmm. I, I, just, I just really can't stand that. So, so look up their licensure look up their board certification. And I always recommend trying to get an appointment with a medical director because that way you'll find out whether they're ever there or not. If the medical director is never there, you will never be able to see them for a consultation. So I think that's very important. And, and yeah, and don't go to any stem cell clinics. In my opinion, it's not ready for prime time and, and definitely not worth your money. And if you are looking for stem cell research, there's some really great research going on in academic institutions across the country and your doctor can get you connected with those or you can try to get connected with them yourself. But those, those are very strict criteria for entry to make sure you're the right candidate because these studies are very, very difficult to carry out. But anyone promising you that they can take a stem cell from your fat I mean, they'll sell it as, oh, we take some fat out too. So nobody wants any fat, right? And it's really um, well, very fringy and should, you know, should not, I would not pay money for that. By the way, remember that orthopedic center that I told you that Josh went to? Yeah. They've revamped their website and now they call it bone marrow cell therapy instead uh -huh. of stem cell therapy. Bone marrow cell it, That's interesting. So it's, yeah, so it's a minimally invasive procedure where they probably go in and take bone marrow from the patient, just like they took the plasma. Yeah, from that's Russian, a very interesting you know. idea. I, I want everybody to know that obtaining bone marrow is extremely painful. So it's inside your bone. Think about yeah, that. Yeah, that's what I. So that's what I've heard. <laughs> when I was at med school, I did that. assist on a couple of, of bone marrow aspirates, and they take it out of your pelvis, 
the it's super painful. So uh, I'm not saying that it's worthless. And that is how these bone marrow biopsies are done. And that's how bone marrow is obtained for, for the purposes of, of bone marrow transplants. But it's extremely experimental to be using any kind of stem cell to regenerate tissue. And you think about it, if, if you take a stem cell from your bone marrow, do you think it can develop into any old cell? Can it develop into a heart cell or a brain cell? Typically, no. Are there circumstances in the lab where you could do stuff to that cell to try to make it change its mind, <laughs> go back and become a different cell? Those are very, very exper experimental things. And I just so people understand, I have a pet peeve about stem cells for skincare because there are, that's one of the trends is talking about plant stem cells in skincare products. Oh, yeah. As I've those, seen do, that. As I've those seen do that. anything. Okay. Just so you know, a stem cell from an apple, apple stem cells are very popular, will do nothing to a human. Okay. So <laughs> apple stem cells, it's, ridiculous to claim that apple stem cells can do yeah. anything for your skin. So don't buy those things. It's a, it's a big bogus lie. It's just ridiculous. Okay. And, and there are, I just, I, that's a whole other topic. I would love to do a, a podcast about claims about growth factors and, and, and stem cells because it, it's all over the map. And, and obviously there's research in some of these things, but like a lot of skincare because skincare is not regulated at all, not regulated by the FDA, you can say anything on the, on your skincare product, your lotion or whatever, and nobody's checking on that. And it's not illegal to say apple stem cells for clear, beautiful skin. So, I mean, I think what it comes down to is risk level, right? Like FDA is just considering that super low risk. Yeah. And, oh, it's not yeah, risky you except money. to your pocketbook. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Oh, it's very risky right. there. That's On that sure. note, hey, Becky, oh, right. thanks so much for joining me this morning. As always, it's great to talk with you. And I'm sure yeah. there will be yet another legal case to bring up next time. Thanks, Kate. Good to talk to you. If you've learned something and like what we're doing, please tell your friends and give us a five-star rating in your podcast app. If you have a question or a crazy story of your own you'd like to share, please send an email or voice recording to info at drkatede.com, that's D-R-K-A-T-E-D-E-E.com, or reach us through the website medspamayhem.com. And read the book. Med Spa Mayhem is available everywhere books are sold. Thanks for listening. This has been Med Spa Mayhem with Dr. Kate D. We are so grateful you're listening, and we hope you've learned at least one fun or possibly disturbing fact today. Don't forget to hit subscribe on your podcast app and leave us a five-star review. And read the book. Med Spa Mayhem is available everywhere books are sold. Links and more can be found in the show notes and on medspamayhem.com. Medspa Mayhem.